hopefully um, any technical difficulties logging into the event. Uh, we have a phone number to call. Um, we just reiterated the event number and the password. Um, and then everything is actually recorded and then made available online through our website after. So if there's if there's uh, if you miss anything, you can always come back to the recording. Um, and please feel free to reach out to us on the chat if you're having any difficulties. Um, so we will be issuing CPE for uh, this this seminar today. Um, we have about three words that we'll be saying throughout, so just jot down the words and you'll take a survey at the end. It'll ask you the words so that we can issue the CPE credit. And for those joining virtually, if you just turn off your pop-up blocker, um, at the end of the webinar, then the survey will be able to pop up and, and you can process that. But in any event, you can always reach out to us if there, if there are any questions. Okay. Um, all right. So luckily, we have a bunch of people here that already know us, but for those of you that may be joining online, uh, just a little bit about um, myself and Bob and our firm. We are Gelman, Rosenberg, and Freeman. We're based out of Bethesda, Maryland. Um, we are a full-service CPA firm. Uh, however, about 70% of our business is housed in our audit and um, 990 department. And within that department, we uh, audit and um, engage uh, organizations for the 990. Uh, it's about 99% tax exempt organizations, uh, whether they're located here in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area, uh, nationally, uh, New York, up and down the East Coast and the West Coast, and then um, a very large international practice where we travel quite a bit on behalf of our international NGOs. Um, I'm one of the audit partners in the audit department and uh, have spent my entire career working in the fields uh, with tax exempt organizations, their audit accounting and financial management. And Bob? Uh, welcome, everybody. I, uh, as Jen mentioned, I'm a partner also with Gelman, Rosenberg, and Friedman. And I'm not going to tell you how long I've been doing this, it's too long. Mm -hmm. um, but I certainly enjoy it. and. All of my clients at this point in my career are nonprofit. They're probably the majority are 501c3, probably all but three are 501c3 organizations, and the majority are funded by the U.S. government. So I spend a great deal of time dealing with the Inspector General and everybody else who has issues with uh, audit findings and um, indirect rates, et cetera, et cetera. But it's a pleasure to be here. And um, as Jen said, our, our firm is a full-service CPA firm with over 100 people. We also have a, a separate for-profit and individual tax practice. So there's also that capability um, along with the nonprofit audit, nonprofit tax, separate divisions. And then there's always the outsourced accounting department, which provides um, services for um, clients who need consulting work or interim work here and there. Um, but we're f certainly full service, and even though only one office in Bethesda, we are nationally known and have clients all over the U.S. And again, as Jen mentioned, quite a few international ones also throughout Europe and uh, Africa and Asia. Yeah, great. Thanks, Bob. All right. So today um, we'll be talking about just some trends that are going on uh, in, in the nonprofit industry uh, right now and looking forward. Um, and so, you know, when we thought of this topic, there were certainly things that just came to mind right away that, you know, were pretty prominent as far as affecting a majority of the nonprofits out there. Um, and then there were some additional thought pieces about where the industry might be going. Um, and so really the topics are, are in no way, you'll see it's kind of a hodgepodge of different topics. Um, and the only linkage there is that uh, they're very uh, nonprofit focused. And so um, 
right away, we're, we'll talk about the new administration changes, uh, a little bit about foreign government funding, uh, the millennial donors and social media, um, donor advised funds, phishing scams, and really some IT uh, thoughts. Um, and then, of course, the new the new accounting standards. And you know, we open these are just preliminary teed up topics. So if there's anything that you guys feel that you also want to talk about, um, we're certainly open to that today as well. Um, but so for the very first item, I you know I felt like we should just dive right in uh, head first <laughs> uh, to the big elephant. Um, in the room, and the the item that is and has been on uh, everyone's brain for the past several months, um, and so you know, the new administration has certainly brought a lot of uncertainty to various sectors uh, within the U.S., um, and the nonprofits aren't. Uh, aren't exempt from that. Uh, they're feeling certain things from the new administration that that could have an effect. Um, and so we're going to talk about just two of them. Um, but but really, you know, when I was thinking about this and this topic, I, it felt really close to home. And I think that's a little because we are literally in the backyard of Washington, D.C. And our office is right outside of Washington, D.C. and Bethesda, Maryland. And and since January, there's there's been this almost like palpable, like uncertainty or stress level amongst the majority of our clients and really all of the D.C. area. And so when the change in administration came over in January, it was almost like a lot of our nonprofits or the discussions that we were having were focused around on we don't know. We don't, we're on hold at this point as far as what our strategic plan looks like moving forward, what we need to be thinking about, how we need to be proactive or what could possibly be reactive um, to what we'll be rolling out over the next several months and um, and so uh, and so uh, you know the unpredictability it, it lasted for a couple months and then really the very first thing that we felt kind of shake the community was uh, the preliminary proposed budget mm -hmm. um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that so in the first proposed budget, there were some drastic uh, cuts in discretionary spending um, from some of the agencies. And so with that, we also saw those cuts uh, then funding and increase, increased funding for the Defense and Homeland Security and, and Veterans Affairs. Um, and so with that, the first proposed budget, we saw that the, they wanted to defund 18 agencies, um, including the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, National Endowment for Humanities, uh, the Corporation for National and Community Service, which um, I believe houses AmeriCorps. Uh, <laughs> yep, um, and then Corporation for for Public Broadcasting, which um, funds PBS and, and some of. NPR, and so uh, so there was the there were with these proposed drastic uh, decrease in spending, and and you know I don't know, so this topic it's not new to us. You know we, this isn't the first time that the nonprofit community has seen a proposed budget decrease or changes in the administration that could inherently affect their mission and their federal funding structure for their mission. Um, you know, the, the recession back in 02 and 03, we saw drastic decreases in the levels of funding coming through the agencies, and then again with the, the market crash in 08. So it's not new. You know, this is something that happens um, periodically over time. 
but for some reason it, it just feels it feels different this time around and i think that really is the severity of some of the cuts and some of the cuts that are that would directly affect the communities that that we live in um, and so i had just put down a couple of of the items the first being the EPA, um, which was the proposed, the, the most drastic uh, cut or decrease by, I think it was over 30%, um, and then fully eliminating over 50 EPA programs, um, including funding for the, the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, you know, that's been in the news, especially locally, a lot. Um, and so, there's been some resistance and, and opinions as rightfully so and as expected on most of these items. Um, but that was one of the hardest hit. The next being uh, the Department of State and the Department of Agriculture. Um, they were proposing, and, and within that the USA, the removing the Global Climate Change Initiative, Emergency Refugee and um, Migration Assistance, um, and within the agriculture, the water and waste watershed disposal programs within HUD, the community development blocks. And so, you know, we just see a trend in not that it's affecting just one industry, but a multitude of, of organizations with various missions would, would have been affected by this. Um, so we all know that Congress did not pass, you know, the first proposed budget. So, you know, we could take a step back and, and, and breathe a little bit, but nonetheless, it certainly gives us an, an insight as to, you know, over the next four years, what should we expect? And, um, and for 2017, you know, that's, that's set. So moving on into 2018, uh, what that's going to look like and how our organizations need to, to prepare for that. Um, and so you also want to take it in the context of, you know, what level of federal funding do you have? Because maybe you aren't heavily federally funded and really this wouldn't affect you or um, this wouldn't directly affect you. There may be some indirect uh, results of, of, of these cuts, but um, it's something to consider. And so in the grand scheme of things, you would definitely want to consider uh, how these cuts would structure into your strategic vision and your revenue sources, um, what we need to do to ensure the viability of our organization ongoing um, if these are going to to affect our mission. I think, and, and then I just have a couple of comments here because while what's always being proposed and and i you know emerging trends and when i saw this new administration changes i'm kind of like well that's daily um, <laughs> i'm not sure we can keep up but I, I think everybody should be everybody should know that there will be cuts to their agencies how much yet to be seen i feel and i and i know that there are going to be programs that are going to be cut and I think one of the biggest issues, if I'm if I'm management within the nonprofit sector, if I'm cutting a certain sector of funding to certain groups that get that funding, those groups are now going to position themselves to go after other funding that you may be getting. So, for instance, if they're going to start cutting development grants, but the humanitarian side stays there, and and that will you know, headlines seem to drive things these days. But if what happens is those that rely on development grants are now going to position themselves to move towards humanitarian. So the competition will be greater, and I think that's what every group should probably be looking out for. Um, it's going to, uh, there's going to be increased competition for the funding, and the funding is getting less. It will be less. So. It, you're going to have different players, but you're going to have players with well-known names going after different funding, and that's going to create a little bit of anxiety all, all the way around. And so it's a chance for each organization to step back a little bit and think about what they do and how to position themselves. That's, 
and, and I have no crystal ball and I have no idea what's going to happen. You know, I've been doing this a long time and I would, you know, I've heard about the arts and humanities in the past, but they're still here. I, I just, um, you know, think that when, when everybody sits down and really looks at what we're doing, the agencies, most of them will still be here, but there will be cuts in funding. And it's, it's just, but we don't know how much. Yep, yep, we, we don't know how much, and, you know, we don't know what will happen, but, um, but it's, it's a sign of the thought and the, you know, what the, what the feeling of this administration is, and so, you know, what that looks like over the next four years is, is to be determined. And just on a different note, I know that there's a there's been a significant amount of turnover, and not the cabinet level or the right. appointees. There's a significant amount of turnover at the lower levels, um, or even high management. They're just out. They're they're leaving the administration, and it, and these jobs are not filled. And therefore, <clears throat> what we're seeing is a backlog. Things are not getting done timely any longer. Um, when you submit things to the U.S. government, there's just it, it's it's like a black hole these days. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and I don't see that getting any better anytime soon. Um, unfortunately, I think the time lag is going to get longer and longer. No, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. That's that's something we've been seeing a lot lately. Um, just the unreasonable amount of time to get a response. Um, from a lot of a lot of their, the agencies. So, so on the same topic, um, you know, the proposed budget cuts. Uh, there was <clears throat> there's also this concept, you know, or that there will be proposed tax reforms, um, but you know, there was also some discussion about okay, how are these tax reforms going to um, affect to nonprofit organizations. And while the proposed budget cuts affect some organizations directly through reduced funding, uh, the, some of the proposed tax reform could potentially affect organizations indirectly. Um, and so we wanted to talk through, through basically two of the items that the administration has put out there that, you know, in the tax reform, they would be looking to make changes. Um, so the first being the, sta the standard deduction, and then the second is the discussion about caps on taxpayer write-offs. And so with the standard deduction, you know, at face value, providing a higher standard deduction for the majority of Americans is a good thing. Um, you, you know, it, it's it's not something that at face value says, oh yeah, that's a bad thing, or that's going to affect my nonprofit. But the idea behind that, um, coupled with the the next item that we'll be talking about, is that giving a standard deduction, a, a larger standard deduction, almost de deters someone from saving up, itemize, if someone itemizes their deductions, saving up or adding the charitable contributions or increasing their charitable contributions because they're going to get the higher write-off on that. And so there's a worry in the industry that this higher dedu deduction could deter people from building up those, those charitable contributions. However, we would all like to think that people give, not because it's and that's tax the, related. And that's and the I, discussion and out I, there. And I think that's the message that the nonprofit community needs to put forth. I, you know, it's it's you're giving for a reason to support mm -hmm. the mission of the organization, not because you get a tax deduction. That's the wrong reason to give. Absolutely. Um, so I think there's there's a message and and the. The standard deduction affects those that are your donors that are in the the ten to fifty dollar range or ten to hundred dollar range. The other one that's here is putting a cap on or a limitation on um, deductions, and this affects really a, a small amount of people in the U.S. Uh, when you start capping it at, at one or two hundred thousand dollars, but. 
this will it affects those large donors that that give a lot of money or you know wanting or have the ability to give a lot of money to an organization or a university and i i would like to think that this won't go through when it comes to contributions but i don't know um, but again i think the mission as we sit here and talk about this the the nonprofit message is you're you're giving to support the organization and their mission not because you get a tax deduction and and i realize that tax deductions are important and all that but when you set aside money to give you know a charitable contribution you're thinking about you know what am i doing and you know is is the organization really doing something that i value and and that's all across the board and i think that's I think this is important for everybody to understand, but I, I do believe that the nonprofit community has a has a responsibility to maybe change the message a little bit here and not worry about the tax deductibility of it. I mean, I know it's there and I know it drives a lot of this, but I think the community can do a better job of why we give. And the Americans are by far a great society and give quite a bit of money. So I don't know that a change in the tax laws will change their ability to give, but it's something to, to think about. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion around that out there right now. Um, and and like Bob said, you know, the standard, the people who itemize, it's a small percentage, you know, it's like 20% of people itemize. And then when we're talking about the cap, on taxpayer write-offs, 100,000 for individual donors, 200,000 for married. That's a lot of that's a lot of money. So we're talking about just the top one percent. Um, but the, that top one percent is a huge pot of money for for the community. And so what's what's really happening is exactly what Bob's alluding to is that. There's this analysis of, okay, what is the trend in contributions look like throughout the year? Well, it's relatively stable throughout the year, and then come year-end, there's a huge spike, um, you know, year-end charitable giving. And you would like to think, you know, that is, that is driven by it's the season of giving. It's the holiday season, um, but partially there is the – the reason that people do want to take advantage of not only giving to organizations and missions that they're they're passionate about, um, but the the benefits that that could be received. And so around this, and then the proposed budget cuts um, with both of those items pending or looming out there, um, the industry has taken a real hard look about. Who's advocating for what? What's the mission? What's what's um, the message that's being sent? And let's start collecting data about whether people would still be interested in giving beyond the the benefits of the deductions. And and some of the information that I was just reading or what I've heard is that you know a majority of the people are still are still going to give are passionate about the missions and more so now especially in light of these proposed budget cuts you see that people become even more passionate about saving the Chesapeake Bay because there is the potential downfall of the funding and so um, so yeah there's a lot of conversation going on right now as to what these would mean, what these would look like if they went through, um, um, but rallying the community to make sure we're giving for for the right reasons. Anything else on that? Okay, great. So I want to go ahead and give our um, first um, uh, keyword. I guess that's what we're calling them, um, and it's industry. Okay. All right, so just to, on the topic of funding, while while we're talking about it, when I was thinking through this, I was thinking about kind of what's what's new in funding or or the trend that I've seen over the past couple of years. And Bob, you've probably seen more more than I have um, in the international space, but 
this idea of the, the foreign government funding and really as our our world there everything becomes more globalized and we're working on missions that have a global impact as opposed to just a, a national or a US based community impact um, we've seen this uptick in in this foreign government funding um, what, go ahead. And, and and I'm just going to change this a little bit and and we'll come back to the foreign government in a second but there's also a change in funding here by private foundations Ooh, and, I and, you're who's, talk about that. and yeah. who's doing what and, and where this is all going. I have a lot of groups that um, train journalists around the world. Um, and obviously the media is, <laughs> to, <laughs> to say it lightly, is not a friend of this administration at the moment. But um, should their programs be cut, their the people I've spoken to are not worried because private foundations are willing to step in place, mm -hmm. step up and, and put money where they believe it should be spent. And so on that aspect, it's fine. There are other large private foundations that have funded research for many, many years and to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars that are now going to be doing the research themselves. Mm -hmm. And they're pulling back and setting it up themselves and so the funding that has gone to many groups around the world for research is now going to be done by the private foundation. So that's going to be a big change to some of the groups that receive funding. Um, so that it, it's not just the foreign. The oh, foreign yeah. groups, and this is interesting, because you have, you know, there's different priorities around the world. I, you know, and if I just take Scandinavia for a second, you know, we have Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and, and those groups. And as our country limits what they want to fund, those governments are stepping up yep. and funding. However, their budgets are also being cut also. So the funding is not as great as it used to be. Um, you're also dealing with... Um, the dollar being stronger, and so the, the foreign currency not going as far. Um, but so there's a mix here of, of all sorts of funding sources that are going to be in play. Um, but that's just from the funding side. And I think this is interesting, and it's an opportunity for some groups to look differently. Um, and we still don't know about the EU and what the EU is going to do. Um, I know, you know, the Scandinavian countries are a little different. The EU is in a bit of a flux at the moment. Um, you've got Britain leaving, which, and so now you don't know what their aid agency is really going to do either. Um, so there's, there's a little, there's a lot of uncertainty in that area. Um, but there's also some comfort in knowing that depending on the nature of an organization's mission when it comes to the international programs, there are countries that are stepping up and will step in because they don't necessarily agree with the politics of this country at the moment. Going back to the private foundation where you were talking about bringing that in-house, what, what, who specifically are, do you know? I, I do know, but I wasn't going to mention okay. any names. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was curious because I, I don't um, know. Yeah. There, 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 there's a large private okay. foundation right. where, and they have decided that they feel it's in their best interest or it, it makes more economical sense to fund the programs internally than to do it externally. That's, Which that's is interesting brilliant. because they, but what's interesting is they still have to give the money away. Yeah. So I, yeah, right, as right. a private foundation, so as a private foundation they still work? have to distribute money. And now what I don't yeah. know, what I don't know is whether they're setting up a separate entity. Oh, and, and that is, and that's my, and that is my guess. They're going to set up a separate research facility uh, and, and transfer the funds there. Uh, which it, sector? What? Mainly health and not... I don't want to say health, but maybe disease. How's that? Um, tropical diseases and health. Yeah. <laughs> I know. What? Yeah. yeah there, there, yeah, but I mean that's that's the majority of where, and this is all new, and this is all what I've heard recently, 
Now, whether it's yeah. going to happen in 17, 18, 19, I don't know the timeline, but it's, it's what I hear and it's what I've been told, and it's going to change what everybody does mm -hmm. and to some degree. Not everybody's funded by this group, and, you know, it's, it's interesting, and, and it may be very targeted in some research um, direction. Well, I mean, that gets to another trend that as you're talking about all of this different ways that funding is being allocated, I think a trend that we've seen, and I'm sure you guys have seen too, is um, foundations and others not wanting to fund U.S.-based organizations doing international work as much and wanting to fund local organizations. And, and that's just happening more and more, and so, you know, it, that's another kind of factor in here is, you know, in fact, the U.S. even has a specific foundation just for funding African organizations, and they won't fund anyone in the U.S. working in Africa. Right, and, and I, I have, and, you know, I, I can, I, it's not, again, I don't have a crystal ball, but I can, I can see the argument being made in certain cases if, you know, if there's a relief agency here in the U.S. and a relief agency in, pick a country in Europe, in, you know, France or something like that, why are we giving, why is the U.S. government giving money to the one in France when they could give it to the one in the U.S.? You know, back to America first. I may, I may disagree with it because you should give the money to the group that does the best work and has the most impact. Mm -hmm. But I can see that argument being made. And if I'm, a, if I'm an international organization, maybe I should expect that the U.S. government funding will be cut a little bit. Now, that presents opportunities for the U.S. entities because there might be more funding for them. But again, I think, and this is me personally, I think development, if I'm looking at USAID and State Department, State Department being mostly emergency and some other programs, I don't see that being cut dramatically. I think USAID over time I think the development side of it will start to fade away and those 50-odd countries where they're really fragile with infrastructure will become the focus. And so those players who are big in development now are going to have to shift what their mission is and shift what they do and thus you see more competition going for those humanitarian grants. I just, I see that happening. I, I can see that in the future unless things change dramatically in how we, how the administration looks at everything here. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I just think there's a lot of uncertainty, but I, and again, there's so much of the America first and, and it's gonna change the way the war, it's, it's gonna change the way funding get to the beneficiary and and it's that's all you know it's it's and i think we all just have to be ready for that we're we doing questions now or after yeah why not yeah. do you guys foresee or are you seeing an increase in m a activity on the agency side mm -hmm. and or the donor side i haven't really seen anything yet as far as like on the donor side, I think we're still in the uncertainty phase. You know, I think if we get to the phase where there's an apparent lack of, you know, ability to continue or not ability to restructure, then that's certainly one avenue that that people will be looking toward. What do you think, Bob? I, I think it's, it's in, it, it's, I haven't seen any yeah. different yet. Yeah. Um, do I think it may come? Yeah, yeah. Um, but but it, it's continuing because I think the the scrutiny and everybody's getting a little more sophisticated. So I think it'll come. Yeah, it, I think yeah. Right now we're just treading water, and and it could be a possibility down the line. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully anyone listening online, if you have questions, please feel free to ask or um, contribute? I think you're, and, and you'll let us know when somebody has a question, but I, I also believe that, and, and the next, the next um, slide here is, there, the reporting requirements, the separate audits, I think what you see here is um, donors, I, I do believe donors are changing 
and I'm looking at the U.S. I think donors are, are changing the reporting requirements. They're getting away from just costs, and they're going towards outputs and milestones, and they're getting harder to measure if you're in the accounting sector. <laughs> I, you know, and, and we're laughing because some of us are older, <laughs> and we've been doing this a long time, and it's easy. You know, this is what we've spent. There's my revenue. But I, I think now donors are more interested, and I don't think this is a bad thing, they want to know the impact of their funds mm -hmm. on you know, what's the impact. So there's milestones, there's outputs. Have we reached this? What happens if we don't reach it? Do we get funds deobligated? And I and we're seeing a lot of we're seeing a lot of different grants being written nowadays with you have a budget, you have milestones, but what I'm starting to see, and this is interesting, I'm starting to see grants where they're not, you know, maybe the dollar maybe they've met those milestones but haven't spent the dollars. Mm -hmm. So now, instead of just pushing it out, sometimes they push it out, but sometimes they're actually defunding it or deobligating the money. So what might have been a $5 million grant, but because you were effective and you reached your milestones, your beneficiaries were, you know, you've done what you were supposed to do. So at $4.5 million, so maybe 500000 can be deobligated and, you know, the organization doesn't need it. And I think that's going to become critical for management of the nonprofits to think about how we present other programs and proposals to the donors. What can we do with the extra money if, we, if we've met our milestones mm -hmm. and outputs? And we're, I'm seeing this a lot, actually. This, yeah. is, this is new. I, I completely agree. Uh, this mm -hmm. is new. Um, the separate audits, um, the U.S. donors are actually great about this. They don't generally require it. Um, you know, I, occasionally they'll, they'll ask for certain things, but it's the foreign government ones where they're, they're asking for uh, separate audits, and, and that's interesting. It's generally just uh, programmatic in nature. Um, here in the U.S., I, I don't see donors asking for specific audit reports mm -hmm. uh, rarely. Mm -hmm. I mean, really mm -hmm. rare. Um, that's going to be that would be unusual, and I think I that I think here in the U.S. the the private foundations or those that are um, funding many of your organizations, they kind of rely on your in, your external audit annually. Okay. They they'll rely on that. Mm -hmm. There's a reliance still placed on your annual audit process. Right, but I've seen where they do always want to reserve the right to audit. I, always uh, that, that clause is, will, that clause the, will never <laughs> go away. That would be interesting <laughs> to see. If we see any sort of uptick in I, that, I, I don't think so because I think everybody—I don't want to say trust. Everybody trusts and believes in the audit process, and I think there's a there's a great reliance on the audit process. Mm -hmm. um, should should the audit process start to fail, mm -hmm. you'll see a different change, um, and I don't believe that's going to happen right now. Um, you know, that's a ways away because you'd have to have some large organizations that had really bad audits yeah. because it's not going to be the small one. It's going to be the big ones where the headlines grab it mm -hmm. that are going to dictate the change. Yeah. Yeah, and then coupled with, I mean, that, and the, but then coupled with the, we have seen the increase reporting requirements mm -hmm. and so you know maybe not on a specific audit side but they right. are building into their agreements these additional programmatic and financial reporting um, right. requirements so there, there are requirements and and you know they they are stepping those up yep and it could be in relation to your audit management letter that comes out they you know a savvy donor asks for the management letter um, you know, your financial statements are nice, but, you know, they're after the fact. The numbers are past history. The management letter kind of tells them, are your controls in working and are they working well? Um, so the savvy donors ask for the management letter. Um, I still don't – it's interesting because if I were a donor, that's what I would ask for. <laughs> but I still don't see that asked for in a great no. deal of instances. Many donors still don't ask for that um, you know but but I think as as everybody gets a little more sophisticated and as time goes by I think you'll get that um, 
I will tell you that the U.S. government, for those that get government funding and submit their reports, every you know, once a week I get a phone call saying, yes, I have, your audit, I have the audit report that was submitted. Please send the management mm -hmm. letter. So yes, the government is asking mm -hmm. for the management letter. More and then so they, in recent years. And, and it's, it's automatic now. Yeah, it, now and so I don't know why they didn't make the requirement just include the management letter. But so what you see is, you know, there may be recommendations in a management letter, and, and we do this as well as any audit firm. There may be recommendations in the management letter that don't rise to the level of a finding to be reported to the federal government. Mm -hmm. But they want to see those. Yep. And then... You know, you may get questions, and they may ask for corrective action, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. So we're seeing that more on the federal side. We are. Um, and what what I've seen in some cases, depending on what's in the management letter, is I'll see certain requirements placed within the grant agreement. And it could be timekeeping. It could be subrecipient mm -hmm. monitoring. Procurement now tends, to, even though there's a specific section in CFR 200, mm -hmm. It shows up as a specific requirement in some grants, mm -hmm. uh, you know. So they're they're placing more restrictive covenants and and restrictions within the, um, within the agreements. Agreement. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and again, depending on where you're working, what you're doing, and then on the other side, I've seen grants with very little or almost nothing. Um, you know, if you're lucky enough to get a fixed obligation or a fixed award. Right. It's a two-page award, <laughs> and you know, so you kind of shake your head sometimes. Yeah, yeah, those are far and few between these days. There, even the unrestricted funding. I mean, over the past ten years, you know, there's been that huge shift that mm -hmm. there really is very little unrestricted money is coming to organizations these days. They're usually tagged with a programmatic purpose, um, and mm -hmm. and more so the like we've been discussing, the deliverables and, and what they want as outcomes. So, um, so yeah, I think the theme for not only the foreign government funding um, and the pri private foundation and the federal is accountability. Um, you know, they're, they're looking for reports back on accountability for the funds and uh, what, the, what the actual programs are accomplishing. And it's done through those specific audits, through the terms in the grant agreement, through the follow-up of the audit process. And so we're certainly seeing a lot of that. Uh, the foreign currency. I, <laughs> I threw it in there. I thought it was I, fun to talk fun. about. I, you know, I, I feel like I could spend you know, days <laughs> talking about this. But the reality is, is that the one overriding comment I would make is Separate it. Keep it as a as a separate line item somewhere. Either put it, you know, either as a below the line item after operations or directly to the net asset account. Mm -hmm. um, it it's going to go up and down just based on factors we can't control. Um, I have groups that, and just yesterday or two days ago, I was working with a group on their indirect rate calculation, and they were like, "But we have such a huge loss. We need to include it in our indirect." And I'm like. You're not going to want the gain next year. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, so again, you know, and that's one of the biggest issues I deal with is take it out of your operations. Um, but on the other hand, what you have to spend, and, and again, depending on which way the dollar goes, mm -hmm. you may have more purchasing power with some of your funds than you've had in the past. And maybe you can do more programmatically. So it's a matter of watching it, but but on a financial level, it's keep it out of your operations. And it, it's a it's an inflated number that goes up and down mm -hmm. based on current market trends that we can't control. And anything we can't control, we should keep out of operations. Yeah, I threw this in here just because of the up, the uptick that we've seen this this kind of funding, and it usually comes, the award is is um, structured in a, in a foreign currency, all right, and then we, you know, for nonprofits, we recognize the revenue at time of the award, um, and so the exchange there, um, mm -hmm. and then we receive the cash 
at a different date and there's an exchange difference there and then we revalue at year end our receivables and revenue and there's an exchange there so you know i thought it i thought it was interesting a lot of these groups that are receiving this type of funding um it tend to struggle a little bit about uh, with um, their revenue recognition policies mm -hmm. on all those various transactions and um, the the adjustment or de or even when there's um, some funding uh, taken away in their budget, like how do you restructure that with multitude of, of foreign currency exchange? So the, the smaller organization I just recently had. You know, it was an organization that just started last year, in existence first year, um, and was really small, but then this year received huge amounts of, of DFID and other foreign government funding awards. And, you know, they have one person on staff, you know, uh, they're a growing organization. Their infrastructure hasn't caught up with the funding they received this year. And so, um, so these are things that, you know, they never even considered or, or were able to properly uh, um, put policies in place on how to treat these transactions. So I thought it was an interesting topic while we were talking about the foreign government funding. I mean, and the nice part is generally 2017 or 2016 and 15, there hasn't been a huge increase or decrease in the euro and the pound for the past mm -hmm. year. It's remained relatively mm -hmm. stable. So it's it's when one jumps. And obviously when um, England decided to leave the EU, mm -hmm. there was a huge drop in the in the pound to the dollar. The euro dropped down, but and and now they've they've kind of leveled out over the past twelve months. Um, so we're not seeing the huge up and downs that we saw a year ago. But again, the dollar's getting stronger, so you're seeing um, gains and losses depending on how it was recorded in the past. Yep, yep, yep. So just something to consider, you know, when, when accepting or managing these types of awards. Any, any other thoughts on that topic? And so we'll go on to Bob's favorite Ooh. topic. <laughs> um, so this idea of our our millennial donors and our our social media. Um, and I know probably like like everyone out there, this this term millennial, um, it gets thrown around a lot. Uh, usually not it with a positive connotation. <laughs> um, but you know, nonetheless it is it is a real thing. It is a real generation. It is what everyone is talking about, um, and so we need to talk about it. Um, so this this generation, I guess it's 18 to 32 or 20 to 35. So yeah. I am I am technically a millennial. Right. It's it's the 18 1980 to 1994 yeah. is what it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so this becomes important sure. uh, because. You know, it they're they're the majority of the workforce now, and in third in I think it was by 2030, I, it was they will make up 75 percent of the workforce, and so whether we agree <laughs> with how how they um, operate, how they think, you know their habits, it's it's here, and it's really important for nonprofits to um, rethink their mission, their programs, their marketing, their outreach um, on how to appeal to this, this generation and more so how to capitalize um, on, on this generation. Um, so, you know, with that comes a whole slew of, of challenges, but also a whole slew of, of opportunities. Um, and so we definitely wanted to just kind of go through a couple of of the things that when we're working with nonprofits or what we've seen, um, how their thought, thought process has changed and what this generation really, what's behind their thinking and their motivation to donate um, to organizations because they aren't they aren't your father's donor. They aren't donating 
to your organization. They are motivated by very different things than than the old, older generation. Um, and so we threw up a couple of the items that that were most uh, discussed and talked about, and the first being just the general access to information. Uh, this is a generation that has the internet has never lived without the internet, has all sorts of information um, at their fingertips at any hour of any day, and so they are doing the research. Um, they are looking what's, at what's out there, what's inspiring them, and it doesn't need to be the nonprofit in their community. It's a, a globalized world, and so you know that becomes a huge competition for organizations because of this access to information. Um, you know, if they wanted to donate to a charity, it doesn't need to be the one down the street. It can be one overseas, and so um, com coming with this ac uh, information or the access to information is also a concept of accountability. You know, they they want to research the management letters or go on Charity Navigator and see your rating and, and make decisions based on that. And so they're using a lot more resources um, than a generation in the past has uh, with the ability to, to have this information at their fingertips. The next item, the accountability, which we've already started talking about, and you know, the we started talking about it in the the context of um, they're no longer just here's what you spend and you report back. It's it's a shift in thinking of well, where did my money go? And and in this context, and and depending on the groups I work with, I see a lot of. I see a lot of donations come in and then stop. Yep. Mm. So you're seeing, and this is very different than, say, my generation, <laughs> where you give to an organization and you, you, you keep giving to that organization. Now we're seeing give to that organization, what have they done, stop. Yep. I'm not happy with what they've done. So we're seeing a lot more start, mm. stop, start, stop, um, not the continuous, I can count on this donor. Mm -hmm. So it, it's as if, what have you done for me lately? Yep. And unfortunately, that tends to be universal with the world we live in right now. It's, it's kind of, what have you done for me now? It's a marketing challenge. Yeah, it is yeah, a marketing it is. challenge. It's and it's it, it, all across challenge. the board. And it, it's very different. And I, groups are going to, once again, change their message, understand their donors may not be donors for a long period of time as we've counted on in the past. Um, and, and that's a change for a lot of groups. That yeah, have it's a huge change. And, yeah. you know, where, where groups seem to think about is, is shifting that once we have them in the door, how are we going to keep them? Mm -hmm. And so um, the continual engagement. And so a lot of groups, you know, do make the mistake of, oh, good, we have the, the donor, the donation. But then there's no follow-up, or the re-engagement or continuous re-engagement of, of these donors, and reporting back or checking in, here's where your money went, here's what we still need, re-engagement. And so it's been a shift in, in, in how organizations think. And honestly, it's also a shift in, in um, the administrative burden that puts on a lot of uh, of these groups is to maintain that continuous follow-up and re-engagement from, from this younger generation. I, I think what you're going to see, and, and you're getting to it, is what you're going to see is that there's going to be an increased focus on communication in the development department yep. because it's got to be constant outreach to donors. And then the organizations have to make a decision, you know, which donor level is the right ones to constantly put our efforts into. But, but this generation, I keep saying that, but this generation just expects to always be informed. Yep. And, and they're going to want constant mm -hmm. communication from the organizations. And it, it's, I think what you're going to see over time is more people within the development and communications departments at many of the groups. It's, it, and maybe efficiencies here and there within the IT structure, et cetera, et cetera, and how we communicate will 
will lessen that burden, but I would expect that, that there will be an uptick in personnel in those departments. So tying that trend to the trend we were just talking about earlier with regard to reporting on uh, overhead costs yep. and things like mm -hmm. that until those things are allocated, mm -hmm. how would you see those two trends kind of merging is the nice word I'm going to say, and, and how do we deal with that mm -hmm. as an organization that is trying to show that we are impactful and using money in a responsible way without getting you know, oh, well, you spent, you know, only X 70%, percent, only yeah, 70 yeah, percent whatever, of, on, right. on fundraising, mm -hmm. which is like the, the bad, bad, bad thing to do. Um, I think there, I, well, two things, if I, if I can answer, and then Jen, you can yep. chime in. But I, I think there will be efficiencies uh, along the way, and I, and I say that through all of the administrative burdens. And, and accounting is one. There will be more efficiencies as things become more just uh, easier. The electronic age is going to change the way things are done, and you're going to have less people, your costs in that. I think the, the definition of fundraising and the connotation of fundraising has got to change. And, and it's not a bad thing. Maybe it's the wrong word. But mm -hmm. if I look forward, um, you know, is it resource development? Is it something other than fundraising, which is a lousy word or has been given that lousy stigma, stigmatism um, over time? But I think, I think there's going to be an increased burden in communication, as I said. So we're talking about admin, but maybe communication is a program. Maybe that's how we change the way we, we look at things, because communication with donors is programmatic. Call it education, public information, advocacy. All of those terms are, are fine. I think this is a time over the next couple of years, because things are changing quickly, to step back and say, how do we want to present ourselves? And, and how do we... You know, how do we want to present our financial statements? How do we want to present our operations to the public? I'm not sure. Recognizing that most groups do fundraising or development in some manner, but maybe that's the wrong term these days. Maybe, okay, we have to deal with the IRS Form 990, but maybe there's always Schedule O, and maybe we put some numbers down in the fundraising column, but maybe we go to Schedule O and say, now, Schedule O means fundraising, and under that strict definition, that's fine, but here's really what we do. And we, we can write whatever we want on Schedule O on the 990, but I just think it's time to, if I look forward, it's time to change the way we think and the way pre we present ourselves and the terms we use. Because I, I, think, I think communication going forward is really a program. And so even though there's increased there, and maybe we don't pick the cost up because it still has to be funded somewhere. That's the problem. But, you know, and I recognize that. So, but I, but it's how we present ourselves to the general public going forward. And if we can be in front of everybody else, and that's kind of where I would look, you know, can we be ahead of the rest of the groups in how we present ourselves? No, but, I you hit it on the head. And it's it's a time to as as the as the organization shifts their mission and what they're doing to reach these new donors, it is it's time to step back and look at how we're categorizing and defining what we're doing every day. And the traditional definitions might might go away. And, and I would I would even venture to say now is a good time. I mean, if if Jen's statistics are right about the millennials and <laughs> who knows, the baby boomers are going to get pushed out. So I'm <laughs> I understand that. But what what I what's interesting is that if if their impact is going to be so great and they're going to be looking online, and whether it's GuideStar or Charity Navigator, or any other rating agency, the term fundraising should be redefined. 
as, you know, and, and if we're the first group to do that, the old metrics are probably not the right measurement. And so if we fill in the boxes using those old measurements, depending on our group, you know, we may not be reaching the millennials that we want to reach or that group because they're going to look at it and go, oh, they spend 25 to 27 percent on fundraising. That's out of, you know, that, that's not who I want to give to. So there's a rethinking of how do we define fundraising, and we've really drifted off course here. But yeah, we really have. <laughs> but, but it's how, how, it's good though. how do I how do I define my fundraising, and is it really fundraising, or is the majority of what we do public education? And and you know again, I'm this is a public perception issue versus a funding issue. I, you know, we haven't dealt with the funding issue because you still have to fund, whether you call it, whether we call part of fundraising public education and advocacy, we still have to fund it. I would I, disagree with you that you are off topic at all. Because no, no. Everything, <laughs> everything that is on the screen there is about engaging donors in a way I, that is not traditional. Not I, traditional. I agree, and, and we just, it's only because we, I got the fundraising. Yeah. But, <laughs> But it's, I, I just think it's time to really think about the words we use and the connotations. And I can't change the IRS 990 as much as I would like to. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I will tell you, I'd like to make it back to three or four pages. Yeah. But, but, what I, but what I will tell you is that organizations should also take a hard look at development versus fundraising. Development is not fundraising. So when you're filling out the 990, separate out development. Even if it goes in management in general, I, I recognize, but, but there are groups that look at fundraising and say, oh my God, if I give $100, 15 mm -hmm. to 20% is going to fundraising. If it's 15, or 20, you know, 15, to 10, 15 to 20 percent under management in general, people understand the organization has to be run. Right. And, and that's not outrageous. So some of what we do in fundraising can be classified differently. And I'm not, and every group is different. Yeah. So I don't have yeah. any magic right. you know, formulas or, or anything. Range. But yeah. I think sitting down and really looking, talking with management, talking with the people in those departments and saying, what do we really do? And, and are we really fundra you know, if you have a mm -hmm. fundraising department, are they really doing fundraising eight hours a day, every day? <laughs> every day of the year? The answer is no. Most of it is really public education or educating the public. There is an ask at some point, but, but I think it's just thinking about it differently. And, and I, would, I would even like, I like the groups that are starting to come up with different terminologies, and I would, I would strongly urge, let's try to get away from fundraising if we can. It, the connotation over the last 30 years has been this is, you know, we shouldn't spend our money on this. However, we don't exist without doing it. Right. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's a little bit of a catch-22. I have a question from an online attendee. <clears throat> Do millennial donors expect to personalize follow-up slash acknowledgement? So, as it might have been the case in the past, maybe being informed through social media is enough, in which case it might reduce as well the burden on marketing slash communication. Yeah, so We're going to have different answers. Yeah, I know we are going to have different <laughs> answers. Well, um, I mean, honestly, the... The, there's at least from what I've seen or heard, um, you know, there's this concept of like a text follow up or um, a personalized note through social media or I guess Twitter you can like at someone or yes. and so like do that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's a technology investment. Yeah. And, and yeah. so yeah. it that seems to be. Um, it seems to be enough. It seems to be what they want in the constructs of it's a social environment. It's their their identity it's is part of something. it's part of them. It's their identity huh. is on social media. That's that's who they profile themselves to be. And so by by having this piece of what they're passionate about through their their hmm. social media or their text. It it seems to be enough. It seems to be enough. So How? It's a great question. So there, however, <laughs> however, <laughs> however, I think getting communication about what the organization does uh, and what different. they're doing yeah. 
everything on social media is fine. Right. There is no replacement mm -hmm. for a note, whether it's handwritten or whether it's typed with a proper signature saying thank you. That will never go away. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just my generation, but that, yeah. but that, very good. Good. Well, they are two so different things. So if you're things. talking about but small donors <laughs> or engagement, <laughs> social media bots actually can do a lot of your work for yeah. you to make it, and technology can do this in a way that handwritten notes can't. I have, and I'm, I'm a millennial in the room, I've stopped donating to people because they sent me too much. Mail. Too much, too much. I agree. Like more than one. Like paper is, mail or... Paper mail. Okay. <laughs> don't yeah. don't okay. waste don't waste your time and money. I'm just going to throw it away. Yeah. It's, and it does not <laughs> contribute to my online brand. No. Yeah. And to my online presence because if you tweet at someone or post on their Facebook or their Instagram, like you are contributing to what others know about them and yeah. what they care about. And that matters too. That's exactly mm -hmm. that. It's their mm -hmm. social identity. It's, it's them putting out there. This is what I'm passionate but about. How, I how do you deal with donor privacy then? If you're putting it out there for everyone to privacy. see, no, they want, want. They <laughs> want. They want everyone to know. Yeah, they, but they, donor they, privacy is also a thing to consider. I mean, if you look at, if you're gonna expect that people are going to GuideStar and look at your rating there, and you have a big red X because you don't have you're don't have your donor privacy to so, their liking. So you can't you can't engage with someone on social media unless they've engaged with you in some way or given mm -hmm. you their social media information. Right. You still need to send them a donor acknowledgement email. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, for whatever yeah. for the twenty percent of us who, who itemize. But um <laughs> if you're not like I think that if you're not engaging with people in a way it doesn't have to be personal, it just has to feel like they're a part of something. Yes. And and so it's not thank you for giving us a hundred dollars. Yeah. Right. It's you know welcome to the club yeah. of people who care about the puppies. Yeah. You know, <laughs> here's some pictures of some puppies. Yeah. It's a Facebook page for a campaign. Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or an Instagram that account for, specifically for a, a segment of of development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I thought you were talking about actually sending their acknowledgement oh, through no. yeah. social media and then just cheated off. Yeah. I, I know about No, that. no, no, it's fine. <laughs> I, 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 no, 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 and, and, and everybody here would laugh, but I have experience where, you know, acknowledgements for the $100 gift, mm -hmm. while not required, were right. still done, you know, yeah. and the next thing you know, this person $1. is no yeah. uh, way more than that because this is one of the wealthiest people in the country who decided that my god i got a personal note yeah. so there is still that and i think we just have to recognize that both play a part mm -hmm. exactly and i'm not suggesting one is better yeah. than the other but a personal you know and I agree with you on the direct mail yes. campaigns. They're they're a bit over Even the top. Even the newsletters. The news stop with the newsletters. <laughs> Most just stop. <laughs> okay. And that's, that's I mean, and, that, and, that, and that's that fair. is yeah. the millennial generation. Yeah. They're going to read it online. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, unfortunately, I still like to get the newspaper. <laughs> so, so I mean, there there are differences in ages yeah. and and what we do. But I would agree yeah. with you. Most people. With newsletters, it should be online, and mm -hmm. you could, you should be able to say I want it or don't want it. I, it. Sending it in the mail nowadays is kind of I don't even see that many doing that anymore. Um, you know, the direct mail campaigns, while some might say annoying, they're still effective. Um, they people wouldn't do them they if they weren't, and so. Um, but again, know, we're talking about trends and things that are changing. Right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So the. Yeah, exactly. The, and, the, and the, I the think trending. The, and I do believe the direct mail with as this generation gets older, as the millennials get older and Generation Z comes, who's always been online, yeah. always wireless. Always. All, you know, this is a total that's the nineteen ninety five and they're just now entering the workforce. <laughs> but as <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, I just hated everybody. <laughs> um as as these two generations grow up and become the majority of the workforce, I believe the direct mail will become ineffective. Yeah. And and will start to drift away, and and things will be done online. Absolutely. Um, so again, 
organizations are going to have to change the way they think about fundraising. The old models aren't going to work. Yep, and, and maybe we're just thinking forward a few years. That's all. No, then that's exactly right. I think the industry is there. I think mm -hmm. a lot of I mean, at, at a minimum, we we see people are online. I mean, the online donations is a is a must at this point. If you're not there, you're just you're behind the time. Yeah, you're missing yeah. the boat. The other thing is that is the um like your website being cell phone uh, capable. Yeah, mobile. mobile yeah, thank you. Mobile. I'm trying. You know, I identify with the other generation, although I'm a millennial. <laughs> um, yeah, so that because it, you know the generations on their phone and the like. Some of the things that we've we've hit on mostly all of these in one way or the other, but the impulse buy they see something that inspires them. They're going to want to engage right then and there. You know, this isn't that I'll come back to it and put it on my to-do list. They're an instantaneous mm -hmm. generation. And so when they see something, you know, you better have something ready for them to be able to engage immediately. Um, and then, and so uh, just a couple more things that I, I don't think we've hit on is um, this concept of uh, the experience. And so, you know, this is something we see uh, happening all the time now is that these generation, while you know they may still be living on a budget and not able to donate large amounts of money, what they are doing is buying an experience, buying an event, um, and and being able to engage them that way. One of the first things that when I was thinking about this that came to mind is uh, is like um, the color run or like the mud run or something like that. You know, they're buying that that experience. Um, or like the biggest uh, campaign that was out there, the um, that ice bucket yeah, challenge. That yeah. yeah, I mean, that it's huge. And they were doing it not because they were supporting ALS or that they even knew what that was. They were doing it because it was an experience and they were part of like this social group and mm -hmm. this network and posting, um, it, all and posting it all online. And um, and so we, we see organizations really trying to uh, engage the millennial generation uh, at that level. And, and honestly, you know, as much as we said they, that they can only be engaged this way, they are passionate about their causes and, and what they're doing. And so they really want to feel like they have some sort of impact, mm -hmm. um, especially if they can't do it, have an impact directly. They want to have that direct in, uh, indirect impact and be able to voice their opinions or support an organization um, on something that they're, they're passionate about. Um, and and I, I, you know, with that, I read an article um, a couple of days ago about about the donors and, you know, if they aren't able to donate, really we've seen a shift in that there's a lot more volunteer opportunities and that nonprofits are almost like subsidizing uh, staff, you know, with the, the decrease in funding and the shift in funding and the restructuring mm -hmm. of the organizations that there's this uptick in, in the opportunity or at least willingness to, I can't give to you, but I'd love to come in and spend an hour of time volunteering. Um, and so there's a lot of that going on right now. And, and, and just one more way to think about how we can engage because it might be volunteering now. And like as Bob said, you know, it might be $100 now, but in the future, if they feel passionate, then there, there's continual re-engagement and opportunity for, for donations. Um, I think we've hit on almost all of these, the social media thing. I, I read an article recently about, um, I guess Facebook recently uh, rolled out just, in, or not recently, but they, Facebook has this nonprofit like charity page that you can go to. And um, it's, it's advice for nonprofits on how to effectively use their Facebook page mm -hmm. to market um, through Facebook. And 
And so uh, they've recently updated some of the items that, that should be on there and how to engage in them. Um, and then the new events page on Facebook, you can use that uh, to market your events. And I've I personally on my Facebook have seen a lot more of the events on the charities and the ones that I'm involved in coming up and it's easier to manage. But but even but these social media uh, companies, organizations are putting that out there. Instagram has trainings on how to engage your donors through through Instagram. Um, I saw a couple weeks ago that they were doing a whole like uh, webinar. Someone was putting on a webinar on how to engage people through Instagram. So, you know, I think everyone's there. We know that social media is an important part of of this new generation and and how they uh, how they interact and and put their their profile out there and what they're passionate about. So, so if there's if the if you're not embracing the social media, it's a, it's a missed opportunity. That's that's where the industry is going. Um, and then the online giving we talked about, and and always looking for the next big, the big campaign, um, and and how basically the a, the ice bucket challenge. Like, how are we gonna put together the next campaign through it through a channel that's going to um, reach a wide variety of people? I have an online question okay. on this. Um, someone asked or mentioned that they don't ask for donor demographics when they donate online. Do others have a good way of collecting that information? Donor demographics. I don't, yeah. I mean, can't you buy services? You can. You can always buy lists um, that would provide that information. But, I mean, I really, you can modify or ask, you know, whether when you donate, like what. Yeah. Whether people we, fill it exactly, out or not. Exactly. Exactly. It's what you, you, know, you it, can it, put it out there. You'd love to have it. Right. But yeah. it's whether you can get it. Right. Is, yeah. is the and other it, thing. You know, if I'm sitting here, you know, giving advice, I'd say get as much information as you can. <laughs> sure. But, uh, you know, when yeah. you're doing it online, you may not, you know, nobody needs to know age, income bracket, yeah. zip code, right. which is how it used to be done. So, <laughs> well, the other so thing that you can think about from that is why you're asking yeah. how old someone is. Um, because if it's about how you want to engage with them, just ask them how they want to be engaged with them. Yeah. Right. Don't ask yeah. how old they are. Say, um, you know, are you on Facebook? Yeah. Would you like to follow us on Twitter? Like... Um, post this to your Instagram and, and kind of whatever, whatever. Yeah. I'd yeah. like to receive your paper newsletter. Yeah. Exactly. And there's a way to, right. there's a way to, to engage. And you can do that in a more holistic way. Yeah, like nobody gets that, you know, like don't call my house phone because right. no one answers it. What the house phone? Not me. I would think. Most groups are going to get away from the printed newsletters. I would think that's I, going to go I, away. I, 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 I mean, it just doesn't even make sense anymore. Right? Um, but but there is a way to get the right yeah, information, and, and the right Google information analytics. is changing. Have you guys yeah. ever heard of that Google Analytics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing. Yeah. Of, uh, like the I'm not, yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> yeah so. Well, the other thing to think about, too, is that it's not just millennials, that one of the biggest groups that, that was surging at least a couple of years ago, and looking at the marketing groups in the room, um, around Facebook was 55 and older. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and a lot oh, yeah. of young people now, <laughs> especially Gen Z, do not use Facebook. Yeah, yeah. It's because different. it's for old people. Well, it's like um, it's Snapchat, or it's, yeah. that's like the new thing, so, right? And yeah. Snapchat is not the new thing anymore. Oh, I don't know. But <laughs> it's... It's definitely a mainstream thing. Yeah, yeah, mainstream. So. Um, it, you know, and if you're working internationally, you know, what's that? I mean, oh, yeah, there's what's that? like Facebook, like people mm -hmm. are like, what? You know, so. Um, yeah, so it's constantly evolving, and, you know, organizations need to have someone to stay <clears throat> on top of it and, yeah. and figure out a way to utilize what, what this generation is using. Well, and it's not just this generation. A lot of people are using it. Yeah. yeah. No, well, sure. they dictate it, and yeah. then everybody else adopts it. Oh, right. So, but now, like, yeah. that's, if yeah. you want to reach people 55 and older, 
they're looking at pictures of their grandkids on Facebook. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's and, why it takes to have those young folks on staff. Well, and, and that's, that's, or volunteers to help you. Yeah. Well, no, and that, that's a really interesting case a study that you just met. And most groups are going to constantly need young people, and whether they're on staff or volunteers, mm -hmm. you constantly need people who are up to date mm -hmm. with the current trends. And we see this all the time. And generally speaking, you know, depending on the organization, you can get volunteers. But college kids, come, you know, mm -hmm. kids that are in college mm -hmm. and are up to date on what's new and how to use it, that, that's a resource that everybody's going to need. And I would just say to temper that, that I've found that people often, young people coming in, have a knowledge of what social media is going on, but don't always know how no, no. to use it very well. They don't. From a, from from a, a business context. From a from business. From from yeah, yeah. So right, actually, but, like, just relying on volunteers no, can no, often but, be a problem. No, no, but, yeah. but there's, in context, they have mm -hmm. to do what, yeah. but they bring, they bring the knowledge of what's new and how to use it and what's there, yeah. not necessarily your message and how to get it to people. Well, and I don't mean just that. I mean that often there, um, it's a very rudimentary understanding. So it's a personal versus business. That's right. Very yeah. It's very different. And there, very different. Yeah. So it's not just your message, but kind of understanding how to engage it strategically, I guess, yeah. is the best way to yeah. And communicate effectively. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> great. Great conversation. All right. Um, so moving on. So one of the topics that I wanted to incorporate here, just because I personally, within my client base, have seen more and more use of uh, these donor advised funds. So just Quick question, do any of you currently use or receive money from donor, from death? No? Okay. Yeah, so I, I, I think over the past three years, I have walked into about six clients that's like, oh, we have these new donor advised funds, and they're, they're setting them up, and they're managing them in-house. And so I went to um, another presentation on it last year, and some of the statistics that they were throwing out were pretty pretty amazing as far as the growth in this type of investment vehicle. Um, and DAPs have actually been around a really long time, um, but what the industry has seen is this uh, huge uptick in the use of these investment vehicles um, through everyday donations as well as like a planned giving campaign um, and being able to to take advantage of the um, tax benefits uh, in this way to give. Um, and so I first just included some statistics so we could kind of see, you know, why this has become or at least visualize um, the growth in this type of of investments, but uh, so in the past year, just 14 to 15, um, it, the, the use of donor advised funds has increased almost 17% just within a one-year period. And then if you spread that out over a five-year period, it was about 14.5% with 2015 being the fastest. And this is data from 15, and then I just read an article um, in the Nonprofit Business Advisor, which you left me, thank you, um, about 16 was an even more exponentially growth than 15. And so we just see this huge uptick in this type of investment vehicle. So the first table being the grant making, so uh, the money coming out of the donor advised funds to the various organizations. Um, and then the second table being the contributions, the money going into these donor advised funds. I think, you, I think you're seeing a lot of money going into donor advised funds only be, because oh, yeah. it gives the donors flexibility. Yep. They don't have to make a decision right away on where their money is going. Yep. And they're getting immediate, mm -hmm. they get the deduction right away. Yeah. And they know that you know, one year they want to give it here, one year they want to give it here. So it, it, 
these vehicles have been around a long time. Oh, yeah, a long time. Yeah. Um, but this is, whether this becomes bigger and bigger, I, I don't yeah. know. Um, but it, 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 it provides immediate tax mm -hmm. benefits and gives you the chance to, if we gave it to this group this year, we don't have to do it next year. And in fact, you know, instead of making a five-year pledge to one group, they have the ability to change. So, yep. So you're saying that's not just at foundations. You're seeing it, like, at your public charities or managing mm -hmm. donor yep. advised funds? Uh, across the board. And then, so those donor advised funds are sometimes not being contributed then to their own charity? Like, yeah. Well, so usually they're structured that they get a CFD off of okay. the, yeah. So they do, if they are managing like them, exactly. If they are managing them in-house, the way you would you would structure your agreement on how you would manage those donor advised funds um, with the donor, and so I've seen them structured different ways. But for example, a donor says, "I want to give to your DAF um, fifty thousand dollars," and their agreement says. 10% will go towards the mission of my own organization, yeah. and then the rest you'll be able to divvy out over a five-year period or a three-year period. Why are donors doing that as opposed to going to organizations that have traditionally managed donors? Yeah, that's, I, I like, don't know the answer to that. I mean, you've got, I, have, I have not seen this. I have, I have, like, I have four clients it, yeah, it, it, that like, are, Why entrust me to that? I don't have any experience. Right, I'm not, that's not the mission of my I, I, would, I wouldn't want to get into speculating yeah. like why their reasoning as to managing them versus going to like, I think, what is it, like Fidelity. Right. Fidelity is like a huge um, yeah. donor advised any fund. Well, yeah. and, and how it's set up is also going to be a tax issue. Right. The right. tax so issue, legal, it, right. you know, you, yeah. you've got to get and, a lot of And I don't want to be on involved. the management side if something goes wrong. Right. And I, that's a, there, there are I legal implications here that I'm not sure I would want to do that. Um, so I, I, but I've not seen this. She's seen yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. it's interesting, I guess, that they were, new business that they're managing it. And trying to get new revenue, but. But even but even the amount of contributions that an yeah. or revenue that an organization is seeing from a donor advised fund that regardless of who's managing right. it that's gone up exactly so um, I've seen it in, in both cases but as 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 Bob was saying you know the the benefits behind being able to park your money somewhere receive the immediate tax deduction um, and you know, you're not taxed on the capital gain mm -hmm. of the investment. So if you're donating in the form of securities, that is, you avoid the capital gains tax. And you can park your money, and if it appreciates, again, you're not being taxed on that, and your ability to give more funds um, to the organizations over a longer period of time, you have some, some decision-making time. Um, okay, so then I want to pause and we'll do our next uh, CPE word. Um, so we already said the first one, which was industry. industry. Oh, good, because I don't remember. <laughs> and so the second one is um, trends. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, so predictable. <laughs> um, okay. So, can we tell? Do you guys need a break or anything? Yeah. I'm gonna, okay. Five minute break. It's a good idea, right? Six of your clients took on managing mm -hmm. Were they like. To, Three of them are really large, like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then the, we're taking a five minute break. Yeah, I was wondering, like, I, I, I had to get up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just really surprised by that. And they went through the whole process of, um, there are also the the ones that took them on are are mainly grant making organizations. That makes sense. ding ding ding. There yeah. we go. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> They're mostly grant making. They're yeah, yeah. grant making. Because I know, like, I think 
IJM had a donor approach uh -huh. about that, and we, at that point, just said, well, we don't do that, but you can set up your donor advice fund with them. Right, you with know, them, yeah. Here, mm -hmm. um, and then you can, you know, we're happy to partner with you. Right. Because <laughs> like, you don't right. want to lose them. Yeah, and it's a big risk. You want to be yeah. able to manage it properly. But that, Oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So here, I'll walk with you because it's kind of hard. It's, it is kind of hard. It's a little bit of a journey. You do a little exercise with your bathroom hey. break. <laughs> Mm. I haven't had a pastry in years. <laughs> <laughs> Which one did you go for? The, the cheese or the one. Oh, I love cheese. I know, let's go. I know, she's with Japago. Kimber oh, Kimberly. Kimberly. Oh, yeah, she's here. Okay. Alright. <clears throat> No, I mean, he's, he's telling me that, you know, he's seen yeah. you know, corporate agreements being bid as contracts, and then the people aren't performing, and then they're getting pulled. Oh, really?
All right. Great. All right. Good break. Needed that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely needed a little break. Um, okay. So we wanted to bring up, you know, all this <laughs> talk about technology and online and social media. Um, you know, we have here phishing scams, but really we can talk about it more in the context of uh, just overall information technology, security, um, cyber security, or, or data security. And uh, I mean, it seems pretty timely because we, I had this <laughs> put together well before, um, you know, what happened, the WannaCry ransomware uh, extravaganza happened last week. And, and so it's, if we didn't need um, another reminder, you know, now it's again in all everyone's face um, just the importance of this idea of, of being able to secure your your not only your your internal networks and systems um, but your uh, donor data. Um, and, uh, you know, it's about protecting the internal data, the donor data, and ultimately about protecting the organization's reputation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that's, you don't want to be the one on the headlines for the donor database being stolen. And so, um, you know, I, it's funny, I had this put together and then, you know, the ransomware, I didn't, but, uh, in February, the IRS released this statement about um, these phishing scams that had all of a sudden shifted and and had always been out there, just like many of these types of um, attacks are, but then became more nonprofit or ventured into targeting nonprofit organizations and. This one was interesting and it, it caught, or when I was thinking about like where we wanted to approach the information technology perspective, I, I included this one because it actually has happened to three of our clients oh. um, with over six figure losses um, within the past year. And so, you know, I thought it, I thought it good to include, but this particular phishing scam, and then we can talk more on a general IT basis, this particular scam, what ha what was happening is that the organizations were receiving, so your HR person is sitting there at, the, at their desk, and they're receiving an email from the executive director, um, and the email is the exact email, not one thing different um, from what the executive director would send asking for the W-2s, and the HR person attaches the W-2s or sends the W-2s, and all of a sudden, um, this phishing scam, they have the employee W-2 information. Um, and then it's coupled with, or uh, to tack on to that, there was an additional similarly structured um, scam where there was asking for an email, but because the issue was is that because it's coming from an email address that was so recognizable and a trusted source within the organization that these employees didn't think twice about providing the information. And so the one client, go ahead. It's just been baffled. Yeah, no, yeah. it is. It's so much. It's yeah. so much. So my, because really at the end of the day, the, the, the comment from us to everybody is when somebody gets an email that doesn't make sense, yeah. why, I mean, why would you send it, it? it's one thing to read it, yeah. but it's another thing to act on it. And depending on where you are in the office or how big the office is, you can always walk down, talk to the CEO, or you can like, email the CEO saying, why do you need this why information? Need everyone why would, w right, there are, there are certain things that you just have to yeah. look at and question. And, and admittedly, we're accountants here, and we yeah. think analytically, and, and you know, yeah. but, but everybody has to have a little bit of curiosity. Yeah. And, and I think nowadays with these yeah. type of scams, and, and some of these are creative, and I like oh, them. Oh, yeah, they're, they're super <laughs> creative. 
I mean, I got it's, one. It's not your relative in Nigeria. Right. No, it's not. It's it's not. not. Exactly. exactly. Really the prince. Like your long lost <laughs> prince. <laughs> I think <laughs> one. I, so I had a um, a spoof email come to me asking me to like, oh, I have this vendor. I need you to wire money, but it and the email looked right, but I was reading it thinking, nah. This this is worded way too nicely. Yeah. Like it, you know, it's just it's just like kind <laughs> of So I think in addition to what their what the request is, people can pay attention to how it's worded and does this make sense for the person it's coming from or the corporate culture? So the number one preventative measure in all of this and yeah. in, in any information technology security is employee training and education. Yeah. And so, you know, when we're talking about all of these scary risks and, you know, what organizations can do to uh, combat or at least try to mitigate some of these risks, and really taking a step back, if, if you're in an organization that hasn't or, or, or has not in the past or does not have this kind of information technology, um, either if you don't have someone in-house or you haven't done an analysis of where your risks lie, you know, that's something we absolutely encourage every organization to do. Um, and the same with third-party providers. Ex- I mean, you're relying, on, exactly. you're relying on a third-party provider to process, to process mm-hmm. let's say, online donations. Yeah. They've got the donor information, the credit card numbers, all of that information. Yep. If that gets out or gets hacked, if you will, you know, is it – hopefully it's them and not the charity. Right. You know, I, I, that gets in the headlines. I mean, that's that's what you're worried about because yep. your reputation, the risk to your reputation is huge, and that's your largest asset is mm-hmm. your reputation. It's not not your ass. It's not your cash. Nope. It's it's the reputation of the organization, and so it's not it's not just your employee information. Although we, you know, the the IT safeguards and everything that goes with personal information. Sure should constantly be monitored and how it's stored and how you yeah. know that that is critical nowadays. Yeah, and we're seeing we're seeing organizations get on board with this. Like more and more we're asked, okay, what can we do as far as like an IT audit or something like that or an IT risk analysis and and really that should be part of your operational um the considerations every year. Okay, what is our risk? Where do we see our weaknesses? Where, what can we do to mitigate those weaknesses? Do we need an internal audit? Do we need a third party coming in to look to give us a different perspective on where our risks lie? And then what can we do to to prevent that? Um, and so certainly we, we talked about the, the education. That is the number one um, thing, the training and the education uh, within the organization to your employees to make sure that they can identify if something looks weird or know what's out there. Um, you know, the minimizing the collection of information and that, you know, the, there was a big push, the PCI compliance a, a long time ago, or I don't remember how long ago that was, um, several years ago, that, you know, you don't store the credit card data in your offices or there shouldn't be paper floating around with credit card data. So being able to minimize uh, the amount of information that you have on on hand or are storing um, and, you know, failure to monitor things such as your third-party providers. And, you know, we think, we always think, you know, oh, it's, QuickBooks or whatever it's a, you know we're storing credit card information on QuickBooks or online and because they're recurring ACH transactions and oh QuickBooks is a reputable company and it and it is but you know what we see that they they get hacked just like anyone else and so ultimately we're responsible what do we need to do to um, make sure that they have the controls in place at their organization that we're comfortable um, with them handling the data and uh, the money on 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 our ends. 
Um, and certainly there are other things to do, you, you know, reporting to the IRS. And, and I recently learned that the, um, like, cyber insurance, mm -hmm. um, and I, I learned that because one of our potential clients had asked us what our cyber insurance was, and they had asked us for um, what our limits were and to make sure that we had enough cyber insurance because rightfully so, they're handing us financial information about uh, their organization. I'm like, yeah, so that's a, it's out there. Go ahead, Mom. Uh, you know, and, and it's, I would venture to say most people should look at their policies yep. and probably make sure they have cyber insurance. I know that we do, but, yep. um, but it, it is something, and it's not just in the accounting world. The fact is everything's become electronic nowadays as much as you know, as much as I like it, and, you know, there are pitfalls. And with everything being electronic, the sharing of information, even in, you know, unintentional, it happens. Mm -hmm. And and you know, things go awry or, or information gets shared. And once it's been transmitted, it's out there. And so constantly monitoring your your security, your IT security, constantly updating and talking to staff and, and management about controls. Um, it, there's so much information that is now um, traded electronically. Mm -hmm. Even when you deal with your auditors, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so much of the work the auditors do nowadays is done electronically, and it's like, oh well, here's you know. Don't please don't send me W twos over the. You know, I, I don't you know don't send me payroll information. Don't send me stuff yeah. like that over yeah. email or, or something. But it like happens. That. But it happens. Yeah. And you know even even if we tell people not to, it's just it's yep. an easy way to transmit data, especially if you're not in the same location. But you ha but there are other ways and there are secure yep, ways, secure, secure files, ways. et cetera, et cetera. But but everybody needs to constantly look at whether those secure ways continually are secure. So it's not just once and done. This yeah. is a constant monitoring constant. issue. But and and you're, it's only going to continually grow and evolve. It's not going to go away at some point. It will only get bigger. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if there is, it's if an organization <laughs> doesn't have an identified risk within their information technology, within their systems, within their data, um, it's time to it's time to move in that direction. But it but it also is frustrating because it it, it requires everybody to think a little bit differently once again mm -hmm. about the information that's being transmitted. Yeah. You know, let, it, let's you know, forget the financial statement. Suppose you're having a pension audit done. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Now that's we're exactly looking. What I was now we're say. looking at employee employee census, documents, yeah, salaries. That, you know, um, I you know social security numbers. Yep. You know. So please be careful about what's transmitted yeah. and how it's done. I mean, there are, you know, it's always, you know, again, if I'm in your office and I can look at it on a piece of paper, I, it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. But so often nowadays, and again, younger generation, everybody wants to do things electronically. It's quicker. It's easier. But once you've sent it, it's out there. Yeah. And that's the other issue here is the added layer of cost. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. A, it's a huge co it's oh, cost yeah. to the organization. Absolutely. With additional security and software yep. and all the other all those efficient all those efficiencies that, that the computers can. have brought, now we're gonna pay for them on this end. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But then you think about what what is the the opportunity or the, the cost no, of I understand the risk, but yeah. it's, it's and not the, only just the risk, but oh, there's yeah. also the operating costs to oh, yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And the staff required. absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. And for those couple organizations that we worked with this year, it's, they were relatively small. It's two million dollar organization, and they lost over a hundred thousand dollars. And then on top of that, now they have to invest an additional, you know, hundred thousand dollars in the insurance and the the security and the new systems, and so. Yeah, it's a, you know, all of that, the cost, uh, it needs to be incorporated in, in our annual analysis. Great. All right. So, so I have a question yeah. that 
is related to this. Yeah. But it's not necessarily as much about security, though security is a big thing that is a big trend that I'm really curious where you guys come from, especially from um, a accounting and process standpoint, and that is about distributed offices and everything being cloud-based because mm -hmm. this is a huge yeah. trend in business and in the nonprofit space in not having physical, mm -hmm. uh, dedicated mm -hmm. physical space for a traditional office, especially as people are working over working from home overseas. Mm -hmm. um, overseas. And it's something that we're thinking about, but one of the things that I, you know, we have these file cabinets, we have these systems, we have all of these things, and we are very cloud-based now as we work, but I'm just kind of curious what what you're seeing in that and, and what are some of the things to think about in in moving from like this very traditional kind of old school mm -hmm. office based system mm -hmm. with the big filing cabinets and everybody's there to sign things and going to a more online cloud based system. Other I'll than let the you security speak on the international yeah. piece mm -hmm. of it. So for those organizations you know, it might have international operations, um, especially the, the, let's just say they're a larger one and have field offices all around the world um, and how that data is integrated from those virtual offices back to the U.S. and, and the headquarters. Um, I'll let you speak to that and what we see. Uh, you know, the the first thing is a lot of those third world countries, the internet connectivity to be fully cloud based and fully operational might not be there. Um, and so while it's certainly a trend in a lot of the organizations that we've seen um, to for for the ones that's possible, put them like an on an online QuickBooks that the files can be sent back and uploaded. Um, sometimes that's just that's just not the case. I, so, I, I have a couple of I have a couple of groups that have really gone virtual with no yep. offices. Yep. You know, and it's a little strange, but you know, mo I mean, it's it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, you know, the 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 worry is where are the documents maintained. You know, how good how good are we at storing information? That's what you need to worry about. Um, approvals, you know, and there are lots of programs out there that can yeah. do this. And I yeah. just worked with a client that has a great new online system that I've not seen before called Blackline, and I don't, you know, but but that's something that's different. But there are when what I'm seeing is not most organizations aren't getting rid of all their offices. I mean, the ones that get rid of all their offices, that's a little different. So there's an office, but now we're limiting the amount of space we need yeah. because people are working virtually, you know, and they can work from wherever, okay? <laughs> so you see that more so. And I, you know, again, cloud-based is fine. Again, the security of the HR files, the security of the accounting records, the security of all of that is constantly being looked at. The approvals, you can have packages, you know, whether it's in finance or HR or wherever, you can have, you could, there are software packages out there that document the approvals on, you know, all the way through the steps. So that's easily done. But um, I don't, it, it, it's really one or two that have virtual offices, but, but everybody still has an office somewhere. Um, the storage of records is different. That's becoming different, and and where are the records being stored, and how are they being stored? I think in different. So you know, I think if you're on a programmatic side, it it can be a little bit easier when you get into, you know, where are we going to have our accountant keep the books and records, and our HR person keep the the personnel files and the salary information and the sensitive data. That's where it's you need to think about, well, can we really have someone running this out of their house mm -hmm. with this type of data um, from our organization? And so, you know, from what, from the ones that I see that have really reduced space because a lot of their employees uh, telework mm -hmm. in, in like all over the nation, you know, not even telework from DC to Baltimore or whatever the case, there typically is still that accounting HR function being housed out of 
um, a physical space, mm -hmm. um, just due to the different nature uh, and sensitivity of data. But some of that's going to yeah. go away. I, I agree. But some of that and will like go Bob away. has said, we have so many clients that have moved to virtual AP processing systems, mm -hmm. and they they work pretty. I mean, they do a great job, no, and and so even that, that we're not receiving paper invoices, cutting printed checks and mailing them out, it's all being done virtually through these um, systems, it's definitely a trend. I mean, it's definitely out there, and, you know, we talk about in, engaging the millennials or how to employ them, and we haven't really talked about that, but... One of the things is the flexibility, this concept of anytime, anywhere work, that you're not in an office from nine to five, and so that becomes an additional benefit for the employees who want to take advantage of that. Yeah, no, I, and, and it's, I'm not, the, the work anytime, anywhere, yeah. it, it presents a problem from some of us who are older who want to manage time and manage, <laughs> but, but that's a different issue for a different day. The, the, the part that I see is, and, and the part that I worry about, is if I'm funded by a donor and the program runs X number of years and I keep these documents, I got to make sure that they are, if they're electronic, I got to make sure that I have access to them at the end mm -hmm. for X number of years, maybe three years past the end date. And so I've got to make sure that you know, that I've really got this secure and that I haven't lost documentation. Mm -hmm. I also think that there's a trend nowadays to get rid of documentation sooner than mm -hmm. you would have if it was physically in this file cabinet back here. Um, people are trying to get rid of documents a little bit quicker. And I worry about the donor that comes in three years later and says, hey, I want to see this, and we don't have it. Right. Well, um, I think so that the IRS has guidelines on document retention, even for electronic records. I, so you definitely want to make sure that, you know, you're complying with, with that as well as anything beyond that. I mean, the IRS donor. is one thing. Yeah. But if you've got a donor giving you $10 million yeah. or $50 million, I mean, yeah. you know, now we've got to, to be got to think differently here. It might be three years past. When right, you three exactly. Final report and right, five-year grant. So now you're talking eight back. years worth of yeah. you know keeping records for eight years. Yeah. I mean, and that's typical yeah. on a large grant. Yeah. I mean, and really that's typical. Absolutely. Likely longer than whatever and, and your my, document And my grant. fear on this is, and and this is just my my fear on this is that you know the company that you've used here now goes out of business. You know, yeah. I mean, over eight years, yeah. things change. Yeah. And drastically. Yeah. And do we have the same security purposes? Do we have the same ability to get information back that we had back then? And how well is it secured? Have, you know, so yeah. it, it's those kind of things that worry me when everything's electronic and we have to go eight to ten years out. That, yeah. Someone who's lived through a uh, $20 million audit of one of our programs <laughs> in <laughs> Afghanistan, and they wanted to see individual paper receipts one third of the transaction. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, 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 that part of that cigar. It, yeah, yeah the cigar, the cigar audit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it we, was, oh, we, we were tagged. Those are fun. <laughs> it was a wonderful experience. But, uh, but, and, <laughs> and again, I, you know, the government's going, the government audits are going to be behind yeah. the rest of the world. Yeah. They're going to be five years behind the You're rest right. of us. So while everyone else but, might be electronic, they're still going to want to see paper. Yeah, you know, and, and, but, but and again, having the ability, and, and the Internet is generally working fine in most countries it nowadays. It you know, is. It has the ability, but the ability to scan documents and then store them and making sure we can get them onto our network so they're secure everywhere yep. is not so easy when you're working all over the world. I think there are also some other issues to consider when you think about, especially, I guess, in the U.S., splitting your workforce up is if they're in different jurisdictions now for payroll taxes mm -hmm. or crossing state borders, and it also increases your exposure for your workforce. <coughs> so You've got, so when you have workers in you know, yeah. 50 different states or 30 different states, the question is, 
you know, we, we need mm -hmm. legal counsel. Yeah, yep. do we have in, to register as a business yes. in the state? Right. Now yep. do we have, yep. that's exactly Next what we're getting into. Does that trigger yep. any sort of sales tax? Are we eligible for our sales tax? You know, and, yeah. and, and the reality is you're going to end up with a larger law firm yeah. <laughs> with yeah. higher rates oh, yeah. because they're going to have to be national and understand all this. Too. So, yeah. I mean, it, there are costs that go with all this, um, you know, and, and you'd like, I, over time, and just like our profession, mm -hmm. you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, we weren't really allowed to practice in different states yeah. unless we were, yeah. you know, had a physical presence there. Now, all of a sudden, we can pretty much practice anywhere. Yeah. Um, so it's changing, mm -hmm. and I think some of that will change. But this becomes a legal issue. Yeah, it really does. <clears throat> and it's it, it's burdensome. I mean, it's it takes yeah. a lot of time to weed through and figure yeah. out what we need to do yeah. if we have a worker in this state working yeah. virtually, um, or if they even travel for work. Yep. Yeah. Hopkins ran into issues where we had people who decided they want to work out there. France, for some, for some. Right. Except that we <laughs> have no legal standing for an employee to be getting paid in France because we don't have a presence. Hopkins as an entity didn't have yeah. a presence there. Right. So you have a whole different set of, yeah. why aren't you paying France, uh, taxes to? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And I actually have an email on that same issue in just a different country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I mean, that's one of that, this is a very multidimensional question that we're kind of looking at right now, and that's one of the issues that we're looking at is if there were someone who was truly based internationally, how would we do that? Would we need to register? And it depends. It, it, I know the question yeah. is it depends. I literally we have a yeah. we have a lawyer working on it right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it still depends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even but I mean, it, you know, it, it, do they? Oh, they're foreign national. They yeah, are they, they an they expat? Are they, are they yeah? Do they become a consultant that's responsible for their own tax? Yeah, yeah. 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 They pay and local taxes yeah. or U.S. taxes? Yeah. What, like, and what all is the it? countries have different mm -hmm. rules. Oh, that. yeah. And every country. What profession are they? That'll trigger it. All, every country has their own. And the employee and the benefits for a local employee are very different than yes. the benefits oh. for yeah. um, um, a U.S. Expat, based employee yeah. expat. And, and so making sure we're not blurring lines there because. Yeah. The government will question. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, in one of the countries we used to work at my old job, it changed like every year. Yeah. Even. So right. as yeah. the government changes or as the wind blows, or <laughs> you can interpret it this way, and maybe that's a valid legal standpoint, but since everyone else does this, like that's what you need yeah. to do, and then you're caught off balance. And some of the countries have gotten more sophisticated and realized that, hey, we can make some money by yep. taxing oh, the yeah. expats. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, there's, that's um, changed. Yeah, the global fund is encouraging that. Some of them. Oh. You need to go after these other funds. Uh, I, I, I am not a fan of the global fund. <laughs> I don't know that anybody is. But the, the editorial for the day. <laughs> we can remove that from the podcast. <laughs> 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 Yeah, this is exactly the question we're getting into. Mm -hmm. It it completely depends on the location, and that that is all legal counsel. Um, mm -hmm. I you know it's yeah. it's different by every state, so. Yeah, I yeah I wouldn't venture. To I wouldn't even <laughs> venture to touch that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good question though. Your question is what a majority of organizations have. It's just it's a question for legal counsel for sure. All right, the so last um, topic, and our third word is topic, so makes it easy. <laughs> Okay, so I would not be an accountant if I did not talk about the new standards um, in the context of what is coming down the line for uh, for not only the nonprofit organizations, but a couple of the standards for um, all industries. So I'm just quickly going to highlight each of the three pending standards um, that are out there that are coming down the line and you know we could do a whole session on each one of these and what this is going to look like um, and I think we actually do have like 
webinars and, and stuff on, on all of these. Um, uh, but I at least wanted to make sure everyone was aware um, that there were three new standards released um, throughout over the past couple years. So let's talk first about the lease accounting standard. Um, and this has been this has been talked about for forever um, that there they were going to change the way that operating leases um, were being reflected uh, within the financial statements. And and so currently we have the the um, capital leases. Uh, under GAAP and then operating leases, the capital leases end up on your, your balance sheet um, and your operating leases do not. They, you know, they're disclosed in the footnotes. And so finally, um, this the new standard was released that for, for nonprofits, it will be beginning after December 15, 2019. So that means December 31st, um, 20, uh, yeah, 2020 will be the first year that it's required to be implemented, that operating leases beyond one year um, will be treated as, uh, as, as if they are a capital lease now. And so they will be recorded on the books as both um, an in-use asset. So from that point in time, what your projected long-term asset is for using that building, that, that space um, what, that you rent, and the offsetting liability that we have for those future commitments mm -hmm. of our operating lease. So um, it will have a big asset, a big liability, um, and they'll be reduced as the lease terms uh, term goes on. I would, and my advice is that this is not hard to implement. Nope. Um, talk to your accountants, talk to your auditors, but, but I would say if you're negotiating a new lease yep. anytime within the next year or two and it's going to run for five to ten years, you might as well implement the standard now yeah. because you're just going to have to restate everything in the future. Right. Yeah, so. and so it'll be a retroactive application. You'll have to restate prior year, so 2020 so with a restatement of 19. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Megan. And I would just say, too, um, if you have any debt, that would yeah, have that covenant. Well, debt yeah. covenants are yep. going to have to be looked at they because this yep. is, and that's the biggest issue with this, is that yeah. debt covenants are going to fall. Uh, if you have debt or a line of credit or loans or any kind of debt covenants, they're, your percentage, you're going to fall out of out compliance, of compliance. generally speaking. That, that's yeah. the only thing I had written here, debt no, covenants. I mean, and, yeah. and that's that a, but that's a big one. Yeah, it's a and, huge one. And I think it's going to, it's going to, you're going to have to renegotiate and, the terms and conditions of the, of and the loans. I was surprised in just talking with our bankers that they're not even thinking about this. Yeah. So that, like, That's true. Yeah, in that is terms true. of just making sure that you explain what the standard is. Because initially they're like, well, that's all new indebtedness. And it's like, well, except it's not. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm um, just being aware of that you have to, you're going to have to educate your banking team to really facilitate that process of updating. there's no question this is, that is the biggest issue yep. out there with I mean implementing implementing the standard putting the asset and liability yeah. on the books is easy for us that are accountants yeah. dealing with loan covenants that you're now out of favor with is yeah. going to be a trickier situation yeah and even and the education piece and even more so um, you know how the industry will evolve as far as like uh, the ratios that we use yeah. to analyze the efficiency of an organization, its its current assets and and current liabilities versus long term, and how that plays into charity navigator ratings and what that looks like on the 990. And so you know the industry will have to catch up um, in a bunch of different places um, with the financial institutions being being a really important one. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so the next uh, new standard that's coming out is actually right around the corner, um, and this is the overhaul of the financial statements for nonprofit organizations. And so 
um, starting with our December 31st, 2018 year ends. Um, so next next year, yeah. Uh, December 31st, 18. 18. That's what right. It so it's it's two years out. I mean, it's yeah. A, well, so well it's 18. Right. Yeah. If you do comparative, you'll right. have to retroactively apply it to right. 17. So now is the time that we start thinking right. about what what are we missing? What would that look like? Um, so a couple things with this this new standard. Um, the first and probably the one that's talked about the most is uh, that nonprofits currently have the three net asset categories, uh, unrestricted, temp restricted, and perm restricted. Well, they're focusing more on um, easier of use for someone to understand. So they've condensed it down to two categories. So we'll show a without restriction and a with restriction column. So your temp and perm will be combined on the financial statement presentation. Um, but you know, as we're we're thinking through this and how to really implement that, you, you we, we don't want to change that within our our general ledger because there's still um, the idea that we need to track our temporarily activities separate from our endowment activities and the earnings on the endowment versus other temporary restricted funding. So, so it, it could just be a presentation issue. Uh, maybe for some organizations there will be a shift in a chart of accounts, but I wouldn't anticipate. Sure. On the back end, there's always better to have more detail that can roll up into a higher level detail. Right. This is this is more external than yeah. internal. Yeah. I would say if, yeah. if your internal books or, or ledgers have all the detail, I yeah. would, probably wouldn't change yeah. them. Yeah. I mean, the footnotes will change, but they're they. It's a chance to look at your footnotes and probably redo them a little bit. But, I mean, the same detail is going to be there. It may be under one footnote Absolutely. instead of two now. Absolutely. That's all. But, it, I mean, it, this is not a big change. Um, no, there are additional. So, for what will be interesting is that so some of the other changes under this is the statement of functional expense will be a required statement. And, you know, for most C3 organizations, it's not an issue. This has been a practice and a best practice for a long time to include something like that. But where it'll be interesting is our, our C6s, our associations, mm -hmm. our, our membership driven organizations. And, you know, that concept of a programmatic versus a, a GNA expense, while it exists, it's certainly not a driver um, for those types of organizations. And so it'll be interesting to see how, how that plays out um, with inserting that new statement, a uh, required statement um, for the association. Uh, there will be some additional disclosures around uh, board designated uh, net assets. Um, so the disclosures will change around that, um, as well as one of the interesting uh, new disclosures will be around uh, the liquidity of an organization. So there will be both um, a quantitative and a qualitative disclosure about liquidity. So we'll take current assets or cash and then reconcile out our our one year liabilities to get to a remaining liquidity balance, whether that be a positive or a negative number, which is then supported by a management discussion and analysis of what that means. And and what they're really trying to get at is um, is more is getting the users of the financials to understand a little better about the resources that an organization has to be able to meet their uh, commitments within one year of the financial statement date. Mm -hmm. So we, we've seen a couple examples of what this looks like and what this is going to look like in the financials. Um, but nonetheless, it'll be interesting to see more so how this plays out and rolls out and, and what this is really going to provide and, and add as part of the um, the users for the financials. I mean, and it's hard to just talk about it without seeing it. Yep. Um, I've seen it, and I, I'm not in favor of it. Um, it's interesting. But, but, <laughs> but what happens is it could paint a negative picture Absolutely. at December 31. 
and by the time your statements are issued, maybe you've been issued new awards or, or something's changed drastically. So I think there's going to go a lot more, there's a lot more discussion yep. and thought process that's going to go into that disclosure as we go forward. Um, when I looked at the examples and the reconciliations, there were negative amounts being yep. showed. That they weren't going to be able to meet their current commitments, but but it's we, one day. It's one it, point yeah, it's, in one a, day of an entire year-long story. Right, you know? and 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 that's why I'm not necessarily in favor of all this. I I understand it and I get it, but it doesn't tell the picture. It doesn't. You know, what happened on December 31st is very different than when your statements are issued, say, March 31st. Mm -hmm. yep. So, I, and I think there's going to be additional disclosures even than what's required that we're going to be adding. Um, because yeah, if, if your position is in a negative aspect at December 31st, you're going to want to update that mm -hmm. as of March. As and of so, your financial statement. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think that's where there's just going to be constant updating yep. as it goes along. Yep, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves because that's the biggest complaint about it, that. It really it is. is, and and I am right there with everybody <laughs> else. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so the final uh, standard that's coming out um, is the new rec revenue recognition standard. So we have we have a new standard every year for the next, starting in eighteen for the next three years. <laughs> so. This one is actually um, applicable for uh, December 31st, 2019 and, and beyond um, fiscal years. And when the, this standard was, uh, you know, being talked about, proposed, there was a lot of discussion about whether this is actually going to affect nonprofits. Um, and, you know, with, for a long time, we didn't think that it would really have much of an impact on nonprofits and the types of funding that they receive. Um, but ultimately, the standard was issued, and um, it was applicable for all organizations, including nonprofit entities. Um, and so there has been, subsequent to that, some additional uh, technical advice or clarifying issuance by the FASB. Um, but what this does and what this really says is that uh, the recognition from contracts, different types of contracts, will now be uh, evaluated under a five-step process on how we are recognizing the revenue in relation to that contract. And so, you know, while it, it might have been, um, you know, on percentage of completion basis before or, you know, as the funding comes in or an exchange or whatever the case may be, um, now the thought process behind this new standard is that we are taking very specific identifiable deliverables and milestones throughout the life of the contract and management is assigning values to those. It's back to the milestones and outputs. At contract. milestones and outputs, exactly, yeah. for the funding. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily correlate to when you receive the money, when you spend the money, it's, it's, but the revenue recognition will be based on completion of the miles. And, and the hard part, you know, looking at it internally, you'll assign values, you know, yep. we're 30 percent, we're 20 percent, we're 50 yep. percent, you know, as an auditor sitting here saying, Show, prove to me that you've met this milestone. Right, right. <laughs> because many times, and especially in our industry, many times the milestones are, we're going to do this, we're going to reach X number of beneficiaries, yep, we're yeah. going to, you know, whatever it may be, and, and you're going to have to say, we've met, right. you know, and so getting the, yeah. and getting the documentation on how that transpires is going to be different because many yeah. times the you know, for instance, the weather may dictate whether you could actually do it or not because, you know, it could be the rainy season or, you know, whatever it may be. I mean, this is going to be really interesting. But well, that being said, there aren't, I mean, there are contracts, but then there are, and this doesn't flow down to grants. So okay. this is contracts. Yeah, so it's contracts and it, no contributions, right. no grants. Like, so, this is a contract um, specific. But some of you have contracts. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, but there are plenty of organizations yeah. that have contracts. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So it, this is just, and this will, it, there's a learning curve that's yep. going to go with this. Yep, yep. So, um, so that was interesting to see that and and kind of start thinking through that on how that will look on the nonprofit side. So would it apply, you said not to grants, but what about the fixed obligation grants, which are really structured more like They're a structured, contract. but I, but it, it says fixed obligation grant. I take it as a grant. <laughs> <laughs> I think that makes sense. <laughs> I, you know, if, if it had the word contract. Yeah. But I, I think a grant, if it's got the word grant, you stay, stay with that. Great. I mean, these are, you know, and, and over here, Phil, we were talking about this, but I mean, these are, you know, it, and these are going to be the bigger contracts. You know, the smaller ones, we're probably not going to have the huge issues with. But I mean, when you've got big contracts yeah. with lots of different yeah. outputs, milestones, and, and it could be across a region and not just one country. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what happens? Have we met it in one region? You know, I, know. I mean, it's going to be interesting. It'll be. I mean, I, be I think that's going to take some forethought on how we set up the percentages to recognize. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's really what's going to get to this. Okay. And voila. We did it. We did it. <laughs> yeah, no, um, this is great. Um, and we appreciate everyone who who joined us here and online. And as Bob always says, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to us at any time during the year with questions. Um, we're always available and typically we can give you a pretty simple, quick answer um, that might take a lot longer on your own. So um, we're also doing Just one final question. Oh, go ahead, we have a question. Uh, someone wanted to know if accountants can be as efficient as they are in the office when they're telecommuting and what do you notice? I know you and you both do a lot of that. Um, I work better at home, honestly. I am way more efficient. Um, I think I think it's it's possible. Bob works. Bob, Bob works nine months out of the I'm year. Not sure I'm, months. I'm not sure I understand the question because I don't know if it's internal or external. But you know, yeah. for for me, working anywhere or working at home is much more efficient than being in the office, only because you're interrupted all day long. Yeah. But there's a social aspect yeah. that everybody loves. Um, but also sometimes there's efficiency without interruption. Right. Because right. people come see you, they get the answer, they and you get it done. It's organizational. Right. It, it, yeah. You get it done. What I, yeah. you know, but if we're talking about an internal Account. department, uh, uh, yeah. you know, the it's the ability to get onto the network and be able to do what you need to do. Um, right. We're seeing some of that. We're not seeing a lot of that yet. I mean, there, you know, there are certain functions that are still transpiring at the office and not moving. To being done at home. Yeah. Yeah, I I figured as much. Yeah. But um, we're we're seeing we're well, seeing some, to, but not like, a lot. Yeah, that and that goes back to the whole teleworking conversation that we had. That you know, typically that accounting slash HR function is still being housed out of a physical office location, whereas for other employees in the organization, it might be a little bit more flexible. Um, but it also depends on, on, you know, if you have that capability. If, you know, if everything's still being mailed to the office, you know, there's very little wiggle room for someone to be working from home when their job is at a physical location. But, but a lot of it is, you know, can there are functions within the finance department or the accounting department that can be done externally or from yep. home yep. if you have access to the network yep. and can get it done and can get the functions done. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it depends on the role and it depends on what's expected. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I would I would say that it really only works well, in my opinion, if those people who are working from home maintain the same core hours as mm -hmm. the people in the office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Otherwise, it's just a lot. It just compounds it. I, working, telecommuting and working from home is a, is a discipline. Yeah. And it's it not just on the employee side, it's on the employer side to manage it. Yep. Um, you know, people are expected to still be available from, you know, 9 yeah. to 5, 8.30 to 5, whatever the hours are. That, you know, it's nice to be home, but 
that doesn't mean you can just run errands. <laughs> you, you have to be accountable. Yeah. And, and so it's management on both sides. Yep, and you see this now popping up with these telework policies. Um, that employers are putting out there where they define yeah, no, exactly I, and, what and, and I would means. say five years ago when this yep. became very, very popular, yep. people were working from home you know, one or two days a week, there were no policies. No. Now all of a sudden now. every company is implementing policies yep. and what's expected. Exactly. And I think that's really the right way to go. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you Good all. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you, everybody. Thanks. That was great. Mm. It's about the government uh -huh. and six obligation grants, right? Not subject to audit. <laughs> I, I guess Not I, on the FIFA. <laughs> I so I was under the